You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today, returning to the podcast, is Vincent Gloso of Bates College. Vincent, welcome back to Economics Detective Radio. Hey, Garrett. It's a pleasure to be here. So our topic for today is some research Vincent has done entitled Markets for Rebellions, the Rebellions of 1837 and 38 in Lower Canada. So, you know, as a note to the audience, I know from my listenership stats that most of you are international, you know, or at the very least not Canadian. And so so I want to reassure you that this this is going to be generally interesting regardless of whether you have any personal stake in uh, Canadian history or in knowing it, because we're going to discuss it from a sort of general economics perspective. So, uh, so Vincent, um, how about we start with, with the history? Let's assume no prior knowledge of, uh, you know, Canadian history and, uh, and talk about, you know, what, what's the, the historical question here to do with these rebellions and, and, you know, the the general background. So this uh, this project started with uh, Vadim Kofenko of the University of uh, of Hohenheim, and we found it puzzling because some people were saying that these rebellions, which happen in the French part of Canada, uh, even though there's one in Ontario, so like the other big colony at that time for the British in in North America uh, in the 1830s, the bigger one is in is in Quebec, and a lot of historians have just basically stated that. It was a rebellion that was not about economics. There was, and they relegated economic uh, condition aside. But when we were reading it, we thought that, wait, listen, this is actually a really interesting case of markets developing, actually helping the capacity of people to initiate uh, rebellious activity. So the background is like, and this is like the part that's a, uh, like there's a lot of detail, but like, let me try to like summarize them as easily as possible. The French part of Canada is a French colony until the 1760s. Uh, the British conquer it in the 17 in 1763. They get control of Quebec, and the British try to accommodate the French Canadians until there's a wave of American loyalists uh, who, uh, after the American Revolutionary War, come to Canada, and uh, this ends up creating a first legislature in in the colony. And over the decades leading up from the 1790s, when this legislature is conceded to 1830s, there is a building political conflict between the royal officials and the colonial legislature, which is growing increasingly French because initially the first few elected officials were were English Canadians, but as it grew and and as it uh, as French Canadians got familiarized with parliamentary institution, uh, they became a larger and larger uh, constituency uh, in the House of Assembly. And as we roll into the 1820s, they're fighting for control uh, or what we would call re- uh, ministerial responsibility so that they get greater control over expenditures, over project, uh, that the lieutenant governor wouldn't have as many power over them than, they, than he had before. And it keeps – building up to a political crisis for basically a form of de- devolution towards the colony in terms of self-management. But the divide is largely on, et- on linguistic lines, but not perfectly so. And in the 1830s, it boils up to the point of rebellions. So the French Canadians are saying, give us re- like the ability to have a uh, ministerial responsibility so that we can actually make uh, in, uh, internal decisions for ourselves while remaining part of the British Empire. But the lieutenant governor and his council of people that he named wouldn't have as much power. And when they make that request to the colonial secretary in England, uh, they call it the 92 resolution asking for more like for more autonomy for the colony. And the lieutenant governor says the, – the, the, the secretary of the colony says no, and as a result, the French Canadians just decide, OK, we've had it. Uh, let's pick up weapons and fight the British. So there's a rebellion that starts, and there's actually a series of pitch battles between the French Canadians uh, called the Patriots and Patriot uh, in, the, in the French version. And uh, 
English soldiers. So there's a series of important battles. Uh, some of the battles include like many hundreds of men, and it ends up in a complete uh, uh, rout for uh, the rebellious activities. And then in the, in the history of the British Empire, this is such an important crisis uh, that they delegate a guy called uh, Lord Durham to Canada as governor of the two Canadian colonies. And he had to draft up a report uh, explaining what the cause of the crisis were and what the solution was. And Durham uh, makes the argument as follows. We need to assimilate the French Canadians. Uh, they need to become part. They need to become more English. And at the same time, to prevent this happening, we need to actually devolve power towards the colony so that they can manage themselves a little more. So there's a weird uh, result from it. But what we were interested in is why did this rebellion start, right? Uh, not in the sense of why, like the motivation, but how did they come to overcome the collective action problem? Because organizing a rebellion is a pretty hard proposition. Mm. Okay, so as as one might expect when you have two different cultures uh, speaking different languages, living in the same place and trying to, you know, politically dominate one another, you have these tensions. And and the question you're asking from an economic perspective is, you know, presupposing a background of, of tensions and 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 uh, I guess uh, strife. Who who is able to mount a rebellion and and who isn't? Yeah, because that was the thing that was annoying us is, and a lot of the literature that exists on what we could call civil conflicts, so civil wars, rebellions, protests, uprising, is a lot of people that have besides like the contributing factor behind, like the motivating factors. And they'll tend to, hi to highlight stuff like ethnic fractionalization, inequality, uh, decline in economic conditions. But there's a new set of literature that tries to uh, evaluate uh, empirically what makes it uh, possible, so what's the capacity to act upon these motivating forces. So how do people, like, I can say I'm unsatisfied with the current state of affairs in, in Canada, and I could say I really hate what's happening. But if it's costly for me to organize with people who are like me, disgruntled, it's not an easy proposition because there are costs for me of overcoming this collective action problem in the same way that the other party that is equally as disgruntled as I am, has a hard time finding me, and we have to find ways to coordinate. And then it gets harder and harder as you try to get a larger and larger coalition to contest the established political order. And we thought that was actually an interesting sub – an important sub-question that needs to be answered is there will always be some level of disgruntlement towards uh, the institutions. And it will tell us a lot about the benefits from overthrowing a particular – institutional setting, but it doesn't tell us about the cost of overthrowing it. And the cost is basically the collective action problem of how do we organize people in a way that uh, will uh, push back the uh, current, the existing institutional arrangement. So most of the literature that's emerged on that is like, for example, uh, cell phones in Africa provide information and in a way that's so cheap that it actually uh, promotes the ability of people to coordinate uh, protests, uprisings, uh, electoral violence, so they, they can actually more easily contest uh, established political order. Uh, one like big paper is uh, from Darren Asamoglu and a string of co-authors where they check the role of social media and its access to local populations in, uh, in Egypt during the Arab Spring. And what he points out, what they point out, is that access to social media reduced the cost of coordinating a political protest uh, in a way that actually made it more likely that there'd be a coalition that forms to go in the street and say, we want you out of power, we disagree with you, we want a completely new system, et cetera, et cetera. But these were information system, uh, changes to information networks. We wanted to push it a little step forward and say there's more than just the cost of information. There can be ways that actually makes it easier to coordinate. And the argument we put forth in the paper is markets, when they develop, uh, can actually promote uh, rebelliousness rather than actually discourage it. Yeah, yeah. That's so. You know, to to summarize, 
doesn't matter how mad you are uh if you if you can't coordinate you can't really mount a rebellion or a protest or or anything of the sort um you you need those mechanisms yeah if you're mad alone in your basement there's very little you can do yeah yeah you could be a, a lone uh you know a lone crazy terrorist but uh but that's that doesn't make a rebellion that's just uh a single, you know, criminal or, or uh, yes. politically, you know, that's the Unabomber, maybe. Um, yeah, the Unabomber would fall in what you're describing. But the Unabomber, if he wanted, let's say, to convince, maybe there were like a large number of people who believe what he believed, but he needed to reach out to them. And just that cost of reaching out is a collective action problem. And not only that, but collect the, in political process, there's an additional problem that, that pops out. It's not just the fact that you need to coordinate with people who believe the same thing as you but you can also you also have to coordinate with people who are who are just a little different than you are so you must find ground to coordinate a a, a very heterogeneous set of preferences so you must find this is the collective action problem is a really really big deal in in a situation like that Mm -hmm. yeah and i i'm kind of i mean i'm reminded of you know some some of the uh, historical arguments around the invention of the printing press, you know, just really increasing the degree of communication between different people in different places, you know, the, increasing the degree to which one person could reach a large audience um, and and leading to a lot of political chaos in the form of um, the, uh, the word escapes me, starts with an R. <laughs> The breakup of the Catholic Church and the rise of Protestantism. Uh, the Reformation. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> uh, uh, it took me a yeah. second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. Uh, but um, but you know, and and then so being that sort of mirrored in the Arab, Arab Spring, social media is another step above the um, you know, the the printing press in terms of just you know now you now you can communicate with so many people so fast. And, and, you know, and there, there are definitely good, good sides to that, but, uh, you can also, there can also be you know, sort of chaotic elements to it and whether that's good or bad will, you know, leave, it depends on whether you, uh, you value, uh, stability or you think that the, um, you know, the underlying institutions are corrupt enough that, uh, that a rebellion is, is a good thing. In in any case, it, it becomes more likely. Yes. Yeah, so the way the way I I like I like the way you're, you're putting it because it allows me to kind of present it with a slight twist on it. Is all else being equal, right? So we keep the benefit, everything the same, but we just change the cost of organizing a rebellion. If you just reduce that cost, by definition, there should be an increase in the supply of rebelliousness, right? Mm-hmm. The way we're thinking about mm-hmm. it is the marginal cost of an extra unit of rebelliousness, of uprising, protests, or contestants, any form of contestation, of violent contestation of established political orders. And the part that people tend to emphasize is this idea that information networks, so more newspapers, the printing press, cell phones, social media, uh, reduce the information cost uh, component of rebelliousness so that your uh, your supply curve of rebelliousness would kind of shift to the right so that there's an increase in its in the supply of rebelliousness. But the point that we make out is that there's not – few people consider beyond uh, the role of information network, but there's a lot of other things. And the point, the point we make is areas with more developed market have infrastructures which, while they're conducive to growth, like social capital, physical capital, such as roads, uh, manufacturers, uh, these infrastructure, which are uh, really uh, important for economic growth and will emerge more with market developments uh, so that the market becomes uh, a more uh, a, a thicker one in a certain way, uh, you'll find that these infrastructures can actually be, be repurposed for the purposes of fighting. So one way of thinking at it is, Yes, a road makes it easier for the army to attack us, but it also makes it easier for us to move uh, re- rebel troops between cities. Uh, the fact that there's a manufacturer that produces doorknobs, well, it's really easy to change the machine so that they actually produce uh, firearms. So that even though they're, 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 they have one purpose, they can be cheaply repurposed 
for the principle of making a rebellion. Uh, and this is the point we try to bring forth, is that in Lower Canada, the rebellions of 1837-38 are an example of costs of rebelliousness falling because markets make it easier to coordinate uh, and produce the goods that are necessary for, for political violence. Yeah. So, so how, how do you uh, evaluate that claim? Because just the, the mere fact that there was a rebellion, that's, that's a single data point. Um, do, you, do you have some variation in the degree of markets and, and development of, of these markets? And uh, and the degree of rebelliousness that could sort of a- answer this as a uh, you know empirically. Yes. So what we did is uh, to the literature on the Lower Canada rebellions of eighteen thirty seven thirty eight, kind of point out that the rebellious the rebellious and this was the argument that they made for saying economics doesn't play a role in explaining the rebellions and their claim was look the rich areas around. The city of Montreal, which, because I'm from there, uh, is the greatest city in all of Canada. Uh, I had to say it. I'm not. This is a pure, pure scientific statement. Uh, but uh, which is also at that time the richest area in the colony is also the one where the people are the most rebellious, while the poor areas are not rebellious. So the argument that people were making beforehand is because the poor area didn't revolt, then economics couldn't play a role because you'd expect poorer people to revolt. The point we make is, well, there were also the areas that were the richest because they had the highest level of market integration. So what we did was the following, right? So at that point in time, uh, Quebec is basically a frontier economy. People started settling along the St. Lawrence River, which is basically the, the big estuary that falls in the, that connects to the Great Lakes and that connects the Great Lakes to the Atlantic Ocean. And along the river, people initially settled the, the closest possible to the banks of the river, and then they diffuse themselves in the colony, going deeper and deeper in land, so that uh, places that were far away from the further away from the river tended to be uh, disconnected. Uh, there were frontier areas, didn't have a lot of road infrastructure, didn't have a lot of resource, didn't have a lot of uh, of, uh, of resources connecting them to the big cities, the three big cities, and. The thing is, the three big cities, however, on their part, were well connected to to the rest of the Atlantic economy. So they had, if you looked, for example, at the gap in prices between Montreal, Quebec City, and Three Rivers, which are, at that time, the largest three cities in the colonies, they're actually very close uh, to prices in England minus transport costs. So that these three cities are connected to British to foreign markets, so they're price takers because the population is really small. But the areas in the colonies that are not connected properly to these three cities would thus not share in the world economy. They'd be more of closed economy. So what we did is we used the censuses, and the census of 1831 gave us uh, price variations over space. So we knew, for example, that a place that was recently colonized at a price of X, right? And what we did was let's take the absolute distance in price between place uh, that has X price and the closest urban market uh, that, that is accessible. Uh, so let's say like you're in a small city near Montreal, but you're like, let's say 50, 70 kilometers away from Montreal. Well, if your price was five shillings per bushel of wheat and the price of Mo- in Montreal was six, well, the distance is the price distance is one. It tells us the distance in markets of between that area and the main city. If they're connected to the main city, they're easily connected, we would expect the absolute price distance between them to fall. So if you're further away, we don't really care if it's lower or higher than the city. All we need to know is how far distant was it from the city itself? If they were connected to the city, they'd share with the price staking, uh, the price taker assumption of the three big cities, uh, which were connected to England, the United States, and other markets. They'd share that price taking assumption. The larger the distance, the less they shared this assumption. And this gave us the, the opportunity to measure market development through that mechanism. Okay. So, yeah. So, in general, you know, if, if you are 
place that is a, a net seller of uh, of grain, then you know your prices are going to be lower. And if you're a net buyer of grain, maybe your your prices are higher. And the difference there is going to be the transportation cost. Uh, you know, yes. otherwise there's a pure op- arbitrage opportunity that we'd expect to close the gap. Yes, but and, and it works kind of with the logic of the law of one price, right? The law of one price mm-hmm. says that if there is like assuming a way trans like for here I'm going to make a variation on the law of one price, but assuming a way transportation costs uh, accounting sorry for uh, transportation costs, uh, all arbitrage opportunities should be uh, exploited so that prices are converging towards the same level across space, so that you shouldn't find large variation. And we use the price of wheat to do so, largely because the price of wheat is a tradable good. You expect it to be easily arbitraged. Any price distance that remains uh, that we find after controlling, and we do some controls for transportation costs, we would expect is related to barriers or stuff that prevents the law of one price from fully operating. If they were connected to the cities, they'd share the the law of one price with the big cities who they themselves shared the law of one price with England so that prices would converge over space. Yeah. And so it doesn't matter what the physical distance was, you know, in general, if if a place is far away, but easily accessible by, you know, by a direct waterway. Exactly. Uh, the you know the price is going to the difference is going to be pretty low because it's really cheap to transport things over water, especially historically, but still to this day. <laughs> yeah. So this is exactly what we wanted to do. So rather than considering market integration, this is a lot of literature does that, but considering market integration based on distance, we wanted to base it on the price distance, then controlling for access to transportation. And other infrastructure, because there's other factors that would contribute to market integration so that prices converge over space. Uh, It would be, do you have access to a local merchant who's a a store clerk who specializes in buying wheat from the local farmer and exchanges that wheat from important goods that come from England? So let's say uh, this merchant has an agent in Montreal. He gets him to get some, uh, some cotton goods. Which he gives to that, which he takes from that agent, giving him wheat, knowing that the cotton goods will allow him to trade these for wheat in the countryside, or the proceeds thereof uh, would allow him to do this transaction. So, if an area didn't have access, say, to these other infrastructures that speak to market development, would make it harder for prices to converge, and we can control for these. We'll we'll find the effect. We'll find the uh, the market integration story. So that's what we we were concentrating on for saying let's use the absolute price distance between the three big cities of the colony and any lo- any uh, area within the colony, so that the closer the price distance, right, controlling for other factors, the the more integrated and uh, the area was with the big cities, and thus the more developed market institution was. So we would expect more stores in the area, more uh, postal offices, anything that allows trade to be coordinated. And once we control, once we uh, once we check the, the 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 price distance, the price distance becomes our proxy for how developed markets are. And if markets were allowing and were uh, had these infrastructures that we mentioned that could be repurposed for the per- for for fighting British rule. Then it would reduce the cost of rebellion. So the gri- the greater the price gap between the cities, the lower the propensity or the likelihood of uh, of rebellious activity in a district. So we were using that price distance to measure the intensity of market development in order to predict uh, a the likelihood of rebellion, and then if you had a rebellious event, how intense it was. Hmm. Okay. So. Yeah, so I guess the interesting thing is, you know, one might expect a more remote place to, you know, maybe they'd expect to more easily get away with rebelling, you know, because it's harder for, you know, the the colonial power to reach them, um, or you know, may it you don't you wouldn't have a really strong prior on this going one way or the other, um, just 
you know, based based on market integration alone, you know, as, as you mentioned before, historians kind of thought that, uh, you know, the poorer you are, the more uh, incentive you have to rebel, you know, to try to, like, I guess, uh, better your economic situation. Um, and you're making this market integration argument. So there's there's sort of a, you know, a horse race between between these different exactly. sort of uh, theories of uh, of the connection between you know, economics and, and re- rebellious activity. Yeah, ex- exactly. So in the paper, we kind of presented that you would have, some people would point out that markets would make people wealthier, wealth, greater levels of wealth could actually increase the opportunity costs in the event of failure. But this is, this is, as you say, a horse race where we kind of have to disentangle things. We know from like literature by uh, Paul Collier and some other people, that there are some saddle points in the relation between the level of income and uh, the propensity uh, for internal conflicts. So that means that we have to find a way to disentangle these effects uh, in a way that's relevant. So we need to obviously control for distance, an area that was, again, all else being equal, an area that's really far remote from the area of rule, so that it's harder for the center to control the periphery, well, the periphery has a greater incentive in that case to uh, to rebel. But the problem is, is it could be also that the periphery is much, much, much poorer, and the periphery thus has much fewer resources to devote for rebelliousness. So we need to weigh them one together, right? We say all else being equal, the greater the distance, the the greater the the distance from the center, the more the likelier it is to have a rebellion. But if it comes also with the fact that the more peripheral areas are so poor that the effects out the effect the effects of poverty outweigh the effects of distance, then actually you'd find a lower likelihood of them rebelling. What we argue is let's control for these factors and let's bring in the market the mar- the level of market development as our variable of interest for checking what are the costs of rebelling. Uh, one of the costs of rebelling. So basically our model, the way we, we run the regression, is the cost and potential benefits of rebelliousness, some of the different costs that are there, but including the level of uh, market development as proxied by by the price distance. And I should point out that the level of market development here from the literature, I know some people like one of the pushback we had in the first drafts of the paper was – well, you'll probably entangle two things together. You'll probably have some bias of, uh, of, of endogeneity biases. But the point is, is for the price distance, so the level of market development, it came with three important mechanisms for which it would alone be quite relevant and separate from the other so that the endogeneity bias is not as a big deal. Uh, the first one is places that were further away, uh, sorry, places that were better integrated had uh, access to more capital goods that they could repurpose for fighting. So one of the example that we that we found that was hilarious is there's this uh, this this merchant from a place called Vaudreuil, west of Montreal. He has a store and it's a it's a small manufacturer. It's not a big thing, but he actually and that store is not used normally to do weapons. But it's used to do farm implements, so sites, plows, normal stuff. During the rebellion, he repurposes his entire store and his small manufacturer to make bayonets and sabers, right? Huh. That manufacturer would not have emerged if it was disconnected from market, right? That guy tries to manufacture sites and plows. He must be connected to some degree to markets in Montreal where some of the foreign goods, especially metals, are imported. He trades them from some finished good. So he must be connected. Places that have these manufacturers or these merchants on the countryside that are repurposing certain forms of uh, capital goods for fighting, well, they must be connected to market. The other part is uh, uh, villages. Markets develop alongside uh, villages. So that you expect that when you have greater and greater levels of market integration, you would expect also greater levels of urbanization. So, and greater level of urbanization mean that as uh, as an outcome of market development, you get people more concentrated and less diffuse in a in uh, over space, and that's really important because uh, Lower Canada 
is basically an illiterate society. By all standards at that time, it is one of the most illiterate society in North America, uh, low levels of, of literacy, so uh, so that there's, a, there's an effective barrier, which is compounded by low population density. But the emergence of these villages also mean that in the villages, and this is the part that's important that complements the greater population density, is the fact that in the villages there are local leaders who emerge, and they're generally the merchants or the doctors. So people whose uh, services uh, in uh, would have been previously unavailable because markets develop, they can come to the village and offer their services as lawyers, notaries, doctors, and they become local. Uh, the local leaders become the guys who convey the information about rebellion, so they become. Uh, because they emerge as a result of market, uh, will be able to reduce uh, the cost of coordinating in that mechanism. So that's what we wanted to uh, to capture with market integration, these three forms of mechanism, repurposing capital, the development of our urbanization would change it by allowing the result from the as a result of market integration, and the last one being the, the, the role of local leaders in communicating information so that their their normal economic role. So there's one that I really like as a as a quote, and I have to find it, that their their role as local leaders, uh, there was one that uh, I'm looking for the quote now, and it was this um, uh, let me find it. Okay, here we go. Social institutions such as a Sunday mass, which were used to settle local businesses. Uh, local business were repurposed to organize patriot assemblies and federate the different sources of discontent. So the social institutions in any areas would then be reorganized, even though they serve for markets to, to work, could then be reorganized for also making it easier for rebellions to work. Mm, okay. So so the the Sunday Mass was sort of a you know, a local governance institution settling disputes, uh, you know, yes. it's making deals, et cetera. And, you know, you had this as sort of a strong institution that everybody shows up and it's a place to have discussions and transmit in- information that is very easily repurposed uh, to coordinate a rebellion. Exactly. Much better said that I was saying it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So you you have the these different mechanisms, different explanations for why market integration would be related to rebellion. Uh you can't necessarily disentangle those as, you know, as separate causes on their own, at least not in this particular paper, but uh but you you can show that some combination of these led to a higher tendency uh, to rebel in in market integrated places, exactly. And the thing that we decided to do is that, and this is because these patriot rebellions play a large role in Quebec separatism today. They're kind of the uh, the image, just as the Minuteman for the Americans plays a role for regarding to the American Revolution, uh, as a national symbol for more patriot or more nationalistic uh, French Canadians. The Patriot Rebellions of 1837 play an equally big role. So a lot of separatists have tried to measure uh, the amount of rebellions that they were. And one guy in particular, Gilles Laporte, assembled a data set of all the areas that had rebellious events of some sort. So these were petitions, fights, pitch conflicts, assemblies, electoral nominations against the governors, uh, everything that was in the in the buildup. The, the three-year buildup to the rebellions themselves, all the seditious events uh, that they could find, we pull them together and we say, let's see, A, what's the likelihood, so a Probit model, of, sorry, a Tobit model of um, predicting the likelihood of a rebellion happening, and then if you have one, how intense is it? Right, so that we have the number per 1,000 population so that we know how many people are in and the other thing we did is we said, okay, this could be because of the separatism uh, issue that's embedded in it. Some people could have uh, oversold some of the data. So we also took the list of uh, the rebellious leaders that were either arrested, uh, sent a mandate for arrest for being arrested, but they, they were ordered to be arrested but didn't get arrested. Those that were hanged, because a lot were hanged, 
and those that were just accused from different lists. So we just piled them on. Everybody that the British thought were rebellious leaders, we checked using the censuses and the, the details of the prisoner lists where they were from. We matched them to the areas in the census, and we did the same thing. How many rebel leaders do you have in your areas relative to your population? These are two metrics of the intensity and the presence of rebellious event. And we want to use that as our dependent variable to be explained by a, a host of control variables and our measure of market integration. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's neat. And, and it, uh, you know, it make, makes for a convincing sort of empirical case, you know, taking all the all the various every everything you know that you could use as a measure of rebellion rebelliousness and you know dotting i's crossing t's and making sure that they're you know that they that it works uh in all those dimensions and you know you you look at uh you know a few uh, a few other uh control variables uh you know like you know, how what the percentage of of catholics and uh you know, the presence of a post office, et cetera. Oh, yeah. So we wanted to control for some of the obvious things. Uh, one of them mm -hmm. was obviously the amount of wealth that there was in a district. So how much of it could be appropriated through violence? So we're relatively really poor areas. And from that, we were trying to use measures that would not be related to market integration per se. So our wealth index was a measure of the, the livestock that was in an area. So how much animals basically you could seize and the the amount of land that was cleared for farming, right? So we're not including stuff that we're, we're including a control of like here in a way I would say exogenous to our model forms of wealth uh, that are important. We control for uh, what we could call ethnic composition. So uh, even though the divide was not – so some people have emphasized it, and here is – my point is I don't believe it's a big – it's a it's actually true that it's a French versus English story. But if you check the, the, the roster of rebellious leaders, there's a fair share of people with names like Nelson or I forget some English name. But there are some English speakers. Some of them are actually Scots and Irish uh, who are part of, of the rebellion uh, on the other side. But even if the, the lines are not clear-cut English versus French, uh, there's still a, 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 an ethnic component to it. So we control for the share of the population that's Catholic. And by saying Catholic in that period of time, given that there were very few Irish, there were some, and they were largely in one in a few very in a very few limited areas. Uh, so it's not really a big issue. Saying Catholic is saying French Canadian. So we're controlling by the Catholic share for for, et for ethnic factors in uh, promoting rebelliousness. We also control for inequality, and this is we have a really crude proxy for that. It's the census of 1831, which is the closest one to the rebellions, which is also gives us uh, the price data has a question of how many people occupy a house that they do not own. So we use that as the non-owners rate is our really crude proxy for inequality. And the one that speaks to transportation costs is postal offices. And while postal offices would be a little weird, is postal offices would not be opened if there was not a road access. So if we control for distance and post office simultaneously, we control for the whether or not you have access to roads. If you don't have a post office, distance is going to make it is going to be an even bigger deal. If you have a post office, you have a road, which means that it will it will affect your level of transport cost. So we wanted to bring this in uh, to say something about uh, some of the other factors uh, that were relevant to the rebellion. So this is our series of controls uh, that we use. Uh, and all of it was with the exception of some other, like some more exogenous variables, all of them were taken directly from the censuses of the period, so we weren't. We basically went data digging for uh, new data that we had to create from scratch using the census of 1831 in Canada. Yeah, yeah, and it's just good to to know that those things are are covered and controlled for, just so that uh, you know someone can't come along and say, "Well, I think it was the uh, 
you know, I, I think it was the, the presence of post offices that, that really made the difference or, or just, uh, you know, the, the level of wealth, which it's interesting to control for that because one would think that, you know, there would be pretty strong connection between wealth and market integration, but you, you do a good job sort of disentangling that by, by looking at, you know, measures of wealth that aren't, uh, directly related to market integration, you know, so, so livestock, et cetera. So one thing that we also control for, and this was, uh, so initially the project started with, was much more modest. We just wanted to check what the, like, we were pl- I was planning to, to do it with a Tobit model, and that was it. And then my colleague, Vadim, who is my co-author on this, uh, is a really good econometrician. I, ca- I consider myself a good econometrician, but he is like – he's 20 times as good as I am. He's like – he's really, really good. And he says, let's do a spatial probit. So let's try and see if – right, if your neighbor is also a rebellious person, does it reduce your likelihood of being a rebel yourself? So let's bring in an element of spatial autocorrelation to, uh, to adjust for the fact that, well, it's not – every that what's happening in the, the unit next to me will have obviously an impact on this. So we had to use uh, a form of nearest neighbor uh, to get an idea of uh, if there's a lot of people around you who rebel, it will reduce the cost for you of rebelling because, well, you see, there's a ton of them around. It's not really hard to find one. So that's what we did as well uh, to bring it in. And when I say we on that part, Vadim did the heavy lifting uh, in terms of getting this, uh, our spatial Bayesian and sp- spatial probit model, uh, up and running. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and, and of course it, uh, you know, it gets the, the same result as, as your other analyses. So that, which is, uh, you know, re- oh, yeah. refreshing so, so, or, you know, it raises our confidence. Yeah. So we start from very, like very basic analysis. We find there's an effect of prices, even if you do very little controls. Uh, you can find already like a correlation when you start, like you just do a bivariate, you find it. And then when you start building it up to try and say, okay, listen, the bivariate says there's an impact. Uh, what happens if we keep trying to hurt ourselves and add in controls that would wash away the effect? And the thing is the, the effects don't wash away. So we find that the likelihood increases importantly from, from getting a rebellion. And once you get a rebellion, uh, uh, so, sorry, once you get a rebellion, uh, it is also more intense, so that the there's a marginal effect that is increased by market development, and there's also the likelihood effect of having a rebellious event, and the impact is pretty large. The magnitude is uh, it increases the so the greater the gap you have, right? So the the less integrated you are. So imagine that you have a, a one shilling increase per bushel of wheat. And a one shilling increase at that time, the average price of wheat was six shilling. A one unit change in that gap, up or down, so the absolute uh, gap, would reduce uh, your likelihood. So you, so that one extra shilling is one extra shilling more distance, so less integration, less market development. That one extra shilling actually reduces the likelihood of rebellion by some 59%. Uh, so it is a pretty big deal. It kicks a lot. And, uh, once you get one, uh, it actually will increase. So a one shilling increase, uh, will reduce also the intensity by some, uh, 34, by some 34% as well. But they're really big amplitude. And once we controlled for, for wealth, we found similar coefficient. Uh, once we controlled for, for distance, uh, once we control for post offices, uh, the share, the ethnic composition, inequality, we keep finding the results that I'm mentioning. And in some cases, it actually gets stronger and stronger as so rather than losing significance as we build our results, we actually uh, we actually gain significance and the coefficient become uh, tighter, more uh, more efficient in terms of predicting and we get really, really strong uh, results that suggest that the more markets were developed or the less markets were developed, the more you would have rebellions or the less you would have rebellions. So higher market development, higher rebellions, lower market development, lower number of rebellions. Yeah. So let's talk about this sort of 
I mean, it's it's certainly interesting as you know a commentary on this particular event in history. You know, and uh, I mean, it started with uh, uh, we started with the claims historians were making that you know this couldn't have been uh, there couldn't have been economic factors because richer places tended to uh, rebel more, and they expected that poverty created an incentive to rebel, or there was and and we've and you've sort of disproved that you you've shown an economic connection and a strong connection to economics just not in the way they were thinking about but let let's uh sort of generalize from this and and from this this literature you know people people make claims like uh well i mean karl marx uh makes makes a claim that you know the uh, markets will immiserate people and it'll lead to revolution other other people maybe make a claim that uh or you know that authoritarian or or sort of uh, uh regimes that uh that suppress markets are are so inefficient that they have to collapse you know they're they're sort of this cuts against a, a lot of claims about the connection between economics and uh you know the stability of of regimes for instance yeah. You, you, one might argue that, oh, you know, these this dictatorship, you know, if they would open up to markets, there'd be a bigger surplus, uh, you know, for them to capture. Uh, so, you know, so why don't they do that? And, you know, this kind of gives some hints as to as to why, you know, uh, r- certain regimes may not be open to to uh, to opening up markets. Uh, do you have any sort of general thoughts along those lines? Yeah, this actually unlocked a series of things that me and Vadim, we were saying, this this warrants more research on this, because it really started modesty, and we realized that maybe we were doing something, there was something more here. But the first thing is, and this you kind of hinted at it, is, and economists somewhat know this, but they don't really know how much they know it. And this is seems weird, but there's no particular reason for believing that income is a good predictor of rebelliousness or not. And my favorite example when we were looking at this is I, I was actually like, like, okay, do we have example of places that were really, really, really dirt poor and didn't revolt, and a group that was relatively rich that did revolt? And actually, there's there's two there's two examples that we mentioned in the introduction to our paper is uh, France when it does the French Revolution, and it's that that's pretty much a big coordination problem to do. The French Revolution, when you look at like economic history data for France at that period, while not super rich. France is not poor either. There are much poorer places that don't get this kind of rebelliousness uh, that you have in France. But we have another example, Ireland during the Great Famine, which is basically the definition of being poor to the point of being starved and dying. British rule under the Great Famine was never much in doubt so that this extreme poverty didn't predict a rebelliousness so that we should appreciate that there's other factors to weigh in. And maybe these other factors in the horse race of what's empirically relevant probably are more important than income per se. And this leads to like point number two, there's this kind of frequently repeated argue, idea that there's this, uh, this empirical regularity where there must be a point where rich areas uh, will have uh, persistent institutional arrangement. So it's like saying after seven thousand dollars per capita, democracies never fall, right? Or something like this uh, as as an argument. This is assuming that yeah, all, all else being equal, probably there is a saddle point. But in reality, there is no particular reason for believing that the saddle point is consistent over time, and that what creates the increase in income that would lead you to a certain level, a certain form of institution, or a certain form of change in institution is empirically regular. Because the argument that we make in ours is the following. What makes them richer also changes the relative price of rebelliousness versus non-rebelliousness. So we have to consider when we talk about income is how this increase in income comes about. If it comes about in ways that change the relative price between being loyal and being non-loyal, right? So I can produce one unit of loyalty or one unit of disloyalty. Well, if if the increase in income actually makes at simultaneously changes the price between these goods, right? So the development of market 
eases my budget constraints so I can do more of both, but it's easier now to do rebelliousness than to do loyalty, right? So the, the manufacturer opens in the city. This manufacturer, uh, yeah, it makes me richer. Uh, it makes me have some extra wealth that I makes it that there, there's a greater opportunity cost for me of failing. So yeah, I'm not a big fan of that. But look, now I would have before to buy a, a weapon for $100 and now it's $5. Well, the relative price of the things have changed. So we need to consider how this uh, this relation between uh, development and income comes in. And what we argued here was, well, the development of markets changed the relative price of rebelliousness in a way that increased its supply. And it's very similar to what people like Asimoglu or uh, Pierce, Pierce Kala and Holland back regarding uh, cell phones in Africa. Theirs was... Greater information technology uh, would, by definition, uh, uh, make it easier for markets to coordinate. It would make people richer, but it reduces massively uh, the relative price of rebelliousness. So in a situation like that, all we did was take their core argument and shift it to another contributing source. And in our case, it was the repurposing of uh, existing infrastructure for the sake of of rebelliousness so that you would find some saddle points in the relation between incomes and internal conflicts. And so that factors such as inequality, ethnic fractionalization would remain relevant, but they would miss some of the information that we capture somewhat better in our more, I think, more nuanced approach to internal social conflicts. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really, really good point. Um, and yeah, I, I'm also sort of thinking about the connection uh, to the resource curse, right? So what you, you're doing is sort of decoupling, you know, rather than just saying there's a relationship between income and rebellion, the source of the income matters. And, uh, you know, there's a whole literature on, on the resource curse, the idea that sometimes, you know, a, a country having access to really valuable resources can can actually have sort of negative long-term outcomes, you know, uh, and of course, n now there's all sorts of nuance on that, like what kind of resource matters. But, uh, you know, one way for a country to get rich is by finding a big deposit of valuable resources. Another way is it for, for it to become more market integrated. This research, your research kind of bolsters the the, that point that it really, really matters how you know how you're getting your wealth and where where it's coming from and you know how it relates to all these other factors affecting the uh, in in this case the cost and benefits of of rebellion, but uh, but also you know other aspects of of you know political political things you know governance um, you know tendency towards uh, autocracy or democracy, et cetera. Yes. I, so the resource curse is, and now that you say it, I feel like a complete idiot for not having thought about this, but yeah, it would speak to, to the resource curse point because the resource curse changes the value of, of how much wealth there is to appropriate so that, uh, appropriability increases so that, yeah, it does make people richer, but now look, there's something to fight about. And this would relate to stuff like, like uh, for example, Peter Leeson on what he calls efficient anarchy. Uh, why does the state not extend to certain uh, areas of the world? We, we like sometimes are labeled, like, I think, somewhat offensively as primitive societies. But it's because there's so little wealth to capture. right? So why extend rule, which is costly to operate, for an area that's not that wealthy? But if we discover that they have... Well, a really interesting natural resource under them. Well, maybe there's an incentive of appropriating that wealth and that's extending rule. The same thing can be applied in a slightly different language to saying, well, now that there's a greater uh, wealth to seek, to, to, well, there's greater rents to rent seek, well, there's be, there'll, there'll, there'll be more battle over it. And this is where I think it's important to bring back, and this we do it in the paper, is bring back Gordon Stullick's work. Uh, on the paradox of revolution, so that 
we really need to consider the costs and the benefits to individuals and how each change affects uh, these costs. And there's no particular reason for believing that a change affects only one variable at once, right? If it affects one variable more than one other, it may change the equilibrium result that we get. So Gordon Tullock in, his, in this work, it's basically about the discounted value. And so the discounted value of the rewards and punishment that we should consider in order to determine participation in social uprising. And that's, that's the best way to go at it rather than trying to find this, uh, this empirical regularity that people have said, well, this is the saddle point where incomes will make it better. No, it really depends on context and the form it takes in. And here, public choice theory would have a lot to contribute on, on this topic if it's applied more methodically, more, more systematically in the way we believe we've done uh, in our paper. Mm. All right. And on that note, uh, we can close the interview. Uh, my guest today has been Vincent Galoso. Vincent, uh, thanks for being part of Economics Detective Radio. Always a pleasure. If you enjoyed that episode of Economics Detective Radio, come join the conversation in our closed Facebook group. That's Economics Detective on Facebook. And you may have noticed uh, that I have released significantly more episodes in the last few weeks than in the past. I've been very consistent releasing every week or so. And the only reason I can do that is because I have help from my patrons on Patreon. Uh, these are people who make a small per episode donation, just two or three dollars. And it really helps to offset the cost of the show and to pay for editing, which of course allows me to spend more of my time actually doing the interview part, the part that I, as an economist, have a comparative advantage in. I do not have a comparative advantage in editing, and so I'm very grateful to my patrons who help pay someone else to do it. So if you want to become one of my patrons and help me produce more episodes, you can go to patreon.com slash economicsdetective. Thanks, and I'll be back next week.